Hello, and welcome to this Federalist Society virtual event. My name is Sam Fenler, and I'm an assistant director of practice groups with the Federalist Society. Today, we're excited to host Title IX in the Major Questions Doctrine, featuring Jennifer Braceris and Professor Daniel Farber. Our moderator today is Farnaz Thompson. Farnaz is currently a partner at McGuire Woods LLP. An experienced litigator, her practice is focused primarily on labor and employment law and the education industry. Among other roles, she has served as Deputy General Counsel at the U.S. Department of Education and as in-house counsel at the University of Virginia. If you'd like to learn more about today's guests, you can read their full bios on our website, fedsoc.org. After our speakers give their opening remarks, we will turn to you, the audience, for questions. If you have a question, you can enter it into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window, and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. Finally, I'll note that, as always, all expressions of opinion today are those of our guest speakers, not the Federalist Society. And with that, Farnaz, thank you very much for joining us today, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Sam. It's an honor to introduce our panelists today. Jennifer Braceris is a member of the Federal Society Board of Visitors and the Director of Independent Women's Law Center. She also is a former member of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Ms. Braceris is an expert on Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972 and has taught courses on civil rights and constitutional law at both Boston College Law School and Suffolk University Law School. Ms. Braceris is a graduate of the Harvard Law School, where she served as an editor of the Law Review. After law school, she clerked for two federal judges and practiced labor and employment law in the Boston law firm Ropus and Gray. I also am pleased to introduce Dan Farber, who is the Sho Sato Professor of Law at the University of California at Berkeley. He is also the co-director of the Center for Law, Energy, and the Environment. Professor Farber serves on the editorial board of Foundation Press. He is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a life member of the American Law Institute. He also is the editor of Issues in Legal Scholarship. Professor Farber is a graduate of the University of Illinois where he earned his bachelor's, master's, and juris doctor degrees. He graduated summa cum laude from the College of Law and served as editor in chief of the University of Illinois Law Review. After graduation from law school, he was a law clerk for Judge Philip Tone of the U.S. Court of Appeal for the Seventh Circuit, and then for Justice John Paul Stevens of the Supreme Court of the United States. Today, we'll be discussing the holding in West Virginia versus EPA in the context of Title IX, a law prohibiting discrimination on the basis of sex and education programs and activities. The Supreme Court held in West Virginia versus EPA that the major questions doctrine requires Congress to speak clearly if it wishes to assign to an agency decisions of vast economic and political significance. Today, our esteemed panelists will discuss what constitutes a major question and whether elements of the modern Title IX administration constitute a major question that Congress is best suited to consider. With that, I welcome Jennifer and her remarks. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you for having me. Um, so I'm gonna start off and just provide a little background on Title IX. And I think that will help us sort of elucidate um, whether or not the Department of Education has gone too far, perhaps not far enough, but um, arguably too far and how it's, it's regulated or expanded application of Title IX. Um, most people in, in my world, in my non-legal world, when you mention Title IX, they think of it as a sports law. Um, but Title IX is actually both much broader and much narrower than that. It's broader because it prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex in all educational programs or activities that receive federal money. Um, and that, of course, includes but is not limited to sports. Um, but, a na but it's narrower than that because it's not a general sports law that, you know, addresses how sports are to be run in colleges. Um, really, it does no more than require schools not to discriminate on the basis of sex in athletics. Um, the statute, as, as most people know, was passed in 1972 with really the express purpose of ending discrimination against women in education particularly with respect to admissions, 
um, opportunities and services provided by colleges and schools and also employment at educational institutions. But even though the, the purpose was to um, open up opportunities for women and girls, the text of the statute doesn't talk about women and girls, um, and it's not limited to preventing harm to women. On the contrary, the express language of Title IX prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex, meaning that it prohibits disparate treatment of either sex, male or female. Um, so, you know, I think for, for our discussion today, what's really important is that the statute makes no mention of gender or gender identity. It simply prohibits sex discrimination. Now, Congress is, of course, free to add other categories to Title IX, uh, but to date it has not done so. And in fact, legislation, uh, including most recently the proposed Equality Act, which would add gender identity to the categories protected by federal civil rights law has failed to pass Congress. Um, and, and such proposals have failed actually multiple times. So um, perhaps because of that, the Department of Education has issued a rule now that redefines sex to include gender identity. Um, that's not the only thing that the rule proposed last summer does. It, it, it also, redefines sexual harassment law, um, gets very detailed about what schools, um, how schools are supposed to adjudicate claims of sexual harassment or assault. Um, I would argue that it guts due process protections for the accused, uh, that it guts free speech on campus, um, and that it undermines parents' rights in the K through 12 system, and generally just creates a monstrosity of woke mandates on every facet of public and private education from kindergarten through graduate school, um, even making schools liable for things that happen, you know, off school grounds and outside the control of the school. Um, so there are a lot of ways that I believe the regulations far exceed the scope of the statute. Um, and you know, uh, sort of legislate major questions that Congress has not weighed in on. Um, but the redefinition of sex to include gender and gender identity is probably the most sweeping way um, that it does it, as it was basically require every educational institution to allow biological men um, to self-identify into women's locker rooms, sororities, uh, dorms, and other previously only female-only spaces. Um, and probably what people have heard the most about is it would allow them to self-identify onto women's sports teams. So um, now, just to be clear, this rule claims that it's not uh, specifically about athletics, and the department says they are going to issue a separate rule dealing with athletics in the near future. Um, I think that's sort of a duplicitous sleight of hand um, or a PR stunt, if you will, because the rule uh, that they issued defines sex to include gender identity across the board without exception. Does it make an exception for athletics? Does it make an exception for any? aspect of the educational experience. Therefore, it applies to athletics. Um, and I think what they're really going to do, I think they will issue a specific sports related rule, but it will be really granular um, in terms of uh, outlining how uh, athletic teams are to incorporate trans identified biological males, you know, what the testosterone levels have to be, do they have to defer to the NCAA, to the USA swimming, USA rowing, whatever? It'll get into very, very detailed regulations. Um, and I think the reason that they put off explicitly addressing sports in uh, their proposed regulation was partly to avoid controversy before the midterms and frankly, partly to avoid uh, maybe having this struck down on, on separation to powers grounds or you know, because of the major questions doctrine. Um, the problem with redefining sex to include gender identity in the sports context, at least, 
um, is that it sets up an insurmountable conflict conflict um, for schools, uh, conflicting legal, legal obligations. Um, it's not possible to both provide equal athletic opportunity for women and at the same time to allow a biological male to take a roster spot from a woman on a team. So under the current interpretation, uh, schools will be violating Title IX regardless of what they do. And that doesn't seem to be something that Congress would have wanted to create. Um, so the question is, where does the department get the authority to, to uh, reinterpret sex to include gender identity? And the answer that the department gives is the Supreme Court ruling in Bostock versus Clayton County. And that case held that under Title VII, the employment discrimination law, um, an employer who uh, discriminates against a transgender employee actually does discriminate on the basis of sex. Um, and the reasoning in that case was somewhat, in my view, convoluted, but, but the court basically said that um, it didn't say that sex includes gender identity or that it's synonymous with gender identity. What it said was that um, um, when an employer fires a male employee, for example, for presenting as a woman, but that employer would not have fired a similarly situated female worker from presenting as a woman, then the employer has treated them differently and disfavorably on the basis of sex. So therefore, um, uh, somebody, a male who identifies as a woman, um, if they're fired for dressing as a woman, has, has been discriminated against in violation of Title VII. Now, um, the court was pretty clear that, that, that they were only addressing Title VII, they were not addressing other civil rights statutes. And I think that you know it's pretty clear that the reasoning doesn't make sense in the Title IX context. Um, in the Title VII context, the court stressed that an individual's employee's sex is not relevant to the selection, evaluation, or compensation of employees. Uh, that is true. But many situations covered by Title IX, um, sex is quite relevant, including uh, the provision of locker rooms, dormitories, any private spaces. Um, sex is, is extremely relevant. It's particularly relevant in the athletic context, um, where really, if you didn't have separate teams for men and women, that women would have very few opportunities to play. Um, serious sports at the college level um, or at the high school varsity level. Um, so sex is, it's not just relevant in the athletic context, it's basically dispositive, um, which makes Bostock's reasoning completely uh, inapplicable in my view. Um, I think also just going back to the statutory text, as well as the text of the older regulations, um, Title IX is explicitly binary. Uh, immediately after the section where it prohibits sex discrimination, the statute goes on to refer to both sexes, um, meaning two, which would make no sense if it were being used to describe a whole range of identities. Um, the statute explicitly talks about men's and women's organizations, the membership of which is limited to persons of one sex. Um, and it talks about reasonably comparable activities, um, uh, requires them to be provided for students of the other sex, again, singular. So, and the regulations governing that govern sports specifically talk about both sexes. So saying now that the statute really meant to include uh, any number of gender identities just seems to be completely contrary um, to the language of the statute, to the language of previous regulations, to um, the structure of the statute and how we enforce it. And it, it doesn't seem to make any sense at all. Um, Bostock was also decided before the more recent West Virginia versus EPA case, which you talked about in your introduction. Um, 
that case was decided in a totally different context, but the court was pretty clear that in extraordinary cases of political and economic significance, the agency must be able to point from a clear statement from Congress to justify its rulemaking. And there certainly is no clear statement from Congress here that the pur purpose of Title IX was to allow you know, Leah Thomas to compete on the women's team at the University of Pennsylvania or anybody like Leah Thomas. Um, Professor Farber will talk more about the major questions doctrine, but suffice it to say, uh, I think there's not only no clear statement from Congress here, as I said before, Congress has actually considered similar language and opted against it. Um, so that's, that's basically how I think the major questions doctrine applies to the gender identity question. Um, outside the gender identity context, um, you know, there's an argument that, the, that these new regs um, go far beyond the statute in terms of sexual harassment, free speech, due process, and all those other things. And I would be happy to address those in the question and answer sec section. Thank you, Ms. Bisperseris. And I neglected to mention that as you have questions, please include your questions in the Q&A function of the Zoom. And as Professor Farber speaks, you're more than welcome to send us your question so that after his discussion of West Virginia versus EPA, we, we may start answering your questions. So thank you. And Professor Farber, we look forward to your discussion of the major questions doctrine. Uh, thank you. Um, and it's a uh, uh, pleasure to be here. Um, I'm um, more of an expert in administrative law uh, than in Title IX. And so I'm not, there are a lot of issues about the application of Title IX I'm not going to try to go into, but I uh, will try to address whether the major question doctrine applies here. I'm going to start by taking uh, a dive into West Virginia versus EPA. Um, it wasn't really the first case to apply this approach. Um, I think you can find cases going back a ways, but especially some of the uh, uh, COVID vaccine mandate and other COVID related cases uh, took a very similar approach. But West Virginia versus EPA is the one that really announces this as a formal doctrine and lays out uh, the requirements. Um, then I'm gonna look at two, um, well, I guess sort of three Title IX issues. Um, and I wanna emphasize, I'm not really here to defend or attack uh, the department. Uh, as a matter of policy or more generally about whether um, there are um, uh, problems under Title IX, I'm really only focused on whether the major question doctrine applies. Um, I guess one additional thing I would point out is that the strongest advocate of the major question doctrine on the Supreme Court is Justice Gorsuch who also uh, wrote the Bostock opinion. So uh, I kind of doubt that he meant to overrule his previous uh, fairly recent opinion. So let me turn to West Virginia versus EPA. Uh, the case involved Obama's clean power plan, uh, which was a regulation under a really obscure provision of the Clean Air Act. Um, and it was designed to cut carbon emissions uh, by uh, forcing utilities to shift away from using fossil fuels and especially from using coal. Uh, the majority opinion was by Chief Justice Roberts. Uh, he said that the case involved a major question and he pointed to four factors. Uh, I wanna say we don't know exactly uh, how these factors are defined or whether they're all equally important. We may get some more guidance from that um, when the court um, issues a ruling uh, in a case that was just argued uh, the other day about um, a debt forget student debt forgiveness, um, where, as I say, we may get some more guidance. So at this point, we have to go with um, what the West Virginia case does. So the first factor is the great economic and political significance of the power claimed by EPA. And, and uh, the court viewed this as the power, uh, claiming a power to eliminate coal as a source of fossil fuels. Um, 
the unprecedented nature of the regulation because it's the kind of regulation EPA was trying to do here was very different than what it normally does in uh, regulating pollution from power plants or factories or other sources. Um, the obscurity of the provision EPA was invoking um, and I want to say this really, I, I teach in this area, and this really was an extremely obscure provision until uh, it came up in this setting. And the fact that numerous bills had been introduced into Congress to do something similar, one of them actually passed the House, uh, but they had been ultimately rejected. Um, and I think it's kind of notable that after the, the one that passed the House failed, uh, Obama said that he had a pen and a phone and, you know, he wasn't going to um, sort of um, uh, acquiesce in what Congress had done. Uh, Justice Gorsuch wrote a concurrence, which uh, Justices Alito and Thomas joined, and he argued for a similar but I think more muscular version of the major question doctrine, uh, but that was a concurrence. He didn't necessarily speak for a majority. And my uh, read uh, which could be disproved wrong uh, as we get more cases, is that um, um, Roberts and Justice Kavanaugh may have a more confined vision of the major question doctrine than the three most conservative justices on the court. So let me turn to Title IX and um, the regulations. Um, the the uh, department says at least that it's not defining sex, that it's uh, uh, at least primarily addressing the term uh, discrimination on the basis of sex. So it's on the basis of that's really uh, the critical thing. And that's more or less what the court did in Bostock. Um, we don't know exactly what the proposed um, uh, regulation will look like. Um, it doesn't seem to me um, like an issue of great economic significance. Uh, it, you know, the, the cost implications, maybe there are cost implications that aren't obvious, but most of the regulation, it seems, doesn't um, raise those questions. Um, and the court has always said economic and political significance. Um, some of, I'm not an expert on Title VII either, although I know more about it than Title IX, uh, but the restrictions on discrimination um, uh, against students or staff based on sex-based stereotypes or sexual orientation um, do seem roughly along the lines of protections given employees under Title VII. And I really don't see, um, I'm not seeing like a huge political pushback against those in the Title VII context. Um, it also doesn't seem shocking that an agency charged with preventing sex discrimination should try to define what on the basis of sex discrimination means. Uh, so altogether, uh, putting aside the sports issues and, and maybe some of the other issues relating to transsexuals, uh, the bulk of the regulation seems like things that are not dramatic, you know, sort of really dramatically um, um, likely to get public attention. I don't know that there's a huge amount of public support, for example, for kicking kids out of school if they come out as gay. Um, and it seems to me pretty plausible for the department to um, do something about that. Or for example, uh, for um, punishing conduct um, by uh, um, uh, female students for being unladylike where um, similar conduct by men might be permissible. Um, I think that the um, issue of transsexuals in women's sports uh, is um, uh, more difficult, uh, but I still don't think it fits the four-part test. Uh, it has, I think, potentially great political significance, but not necessarily economic significance. It's not, for example, abolishing a whole segment of college sports. Um, uh, given Bostock, it's not exactly unprecedented if women's pro teams um, under Title VII might have to uh, consider hiring transsexual players. I don't think it's a wild leap to say that college teams have to include them. I do think, um, thinking back in the Title VII uh, um, context, um, I think there could be an argument, uh, say, about women's pro teams that, um, that sex is a, um, 
a BFOQ, bona fide occupational qualification. And one reason, um, it, it could be that Jennifer's right about what's going on in the department's thinking, but they may also be thinking that in um, the, the women's sports setting, that something along the same lines um, um, as the BFOQ exception might be applicable here, uh, given the need to uh, maintain women's sports as a separate um, sort of category, uh, which the statute, I think, and, and history clearly um, recommend. Um, in, in, the, I, in terms of the sexual harassment rules, um, which uh, are certainly something of interest to me because they apply to faculty and students and staff um, at universities, um, I, I think one can debate um, the rules and there are courts that have raised due process concerns about some of them. But again, I don't see great economic significance uh, to the sexual harassment rules. And they're not as politically salient as transsexuals in sports. <coughs> um, those harassment rules involve procedural changes which don't have the same level of controversy. And the agency has repeatedly taken positions on the issue in the past and in the form of dear colleague letters uh, that you know, for all practical purposes amount to regulations. Um, so again, I think, so again, I really don't think that those are major questions. They may or may not be legally valid otherwise. Um, so I wanna repeat again, that I'm not necessarily defending these rules in terms of policy or legal validity, but unless major question is just a synonym for really, for really controversial, I have a lot of trouble seeing how the major questions doctrine applies. We're really, I think, into everyday important legal arguments about whether these agency actions are unlawful that involve um, using the normal legal tools of interpretation of text, structure, and precedent that courts normally decide, use to decide cases. Um, a lot of people on the, both on the left and the right have read West Virginia versus EPA much more broadly, I want to say. Um, I'm probably in a minority um, in thinking that it's um, a really important but relatively limited holding. Um, um, I, I think many people uh, view uh, West Virginia versus EPA as basically blocking any really hot button regulatory action. Uh, now people, the, you know, liberal commentators just think it's terrible and a license for the court to just impose conservative values wherever it wants to. Conservatives may think that's great. Uh, I, but I think both sides are, are somewhat victims of uh, their own preconceptions about uh, sort of the court's ideological orientation and how that translates into law. I, it, it could well be that this is right and that basically anything that gets enough airtime on Fox News uh, is therefore a major question. Uh, but I don't, I don't, I, I don't really think that's true. And I think uh, that at least at this point, we have to take the West Virginia opin opinion at its word um, and uh, assume that the factors that the court relies on there are gonna be uh, the factors that it will apply in later cases. Um, I'm uh, looking forward to the rest of the discussion and I'm, I'm looking forward to learning more about uh, Title IX law in particular from uh, Jennifer. Um, uh, as I said, um, my intervention is about the, what I think is the poor fit uh, between uh, the regulations we're talking about here or possible regulation in the case of transsexuals in sports and the, um, and the um, uh, opinion that the court gave us in the West Virginia case. Thank you. So I have a, I have a question actually, because I, not knowing that much about the major questions doctrine, I, I don't know how much of an emphasis uh, the court places on economics, and I see what you're saying about um, about 
you know, the interpretation of on the basis of sex, not invoking, you know, finance, that many financial concerns. But the one thing I would say is that it differs from Title VII in the sense that Title IX involves millions of dollars of contractual relationships between educational institutions and the federal government. It's a, because it's a spending clause measure and potentially um, all federal funding is threatened if you don't, if a school doesn't comply with it. I do think there's more of an economic component um, than if there might seem to be at first blush. Um, that said, I do think, um, you know, I guess there has to be something in between everything that's a controversial issue on the news is a major question and only things that cost a trillion dollars are a major question, right? So it's, it, it has to be somewhere in between that. Um, I, I do think the definition of uh, discrimination on the basis of sex and um, frankly, providing equal opportunity for women is a pretty significant question in that it affects more than 50% of the population, um, you know, uh, and everyone goes to school for the most part, right? So, you know, not everybody engages in certain forms of commerce or what have you, but, but everyone goes to school. So uh, it has a major impact on a large segment of the population at least. Yeah, I think the court has never really, they haven't even really defined what counts as major economic significance. Um, in West Virginia versus EPA, they cited estimates that um, uh, compliance would cost several billion dollars a year um, as a part of the economic significance. But I think I'm not, it's not clear whether it was the dollar amount or the thought that they would be, that you would basically be abolishing a whole sector of the industry. Hmm. Uh, that was more important. The, the the opinion, none of the opinions are really clear about that. I think the fact that a lot of people are affected is significant. I think um, in the uh, vaccine mandate case, um, where there was a vaccine mandate that applied to the whole population, basically every every worker. I think the fact that that just about everybody, um, you know. Um, I guess not all Americans or even all Americans of working age are in the workforce, but an awful lot are. And I think that probably did have um, uh, some uh, impact on them, uh, on the definition. But I think that's, I think the biggest problem with the major question doctrine is that the court has not really given us, even, a, even under my view, a very clear um, uh, understanding I mean, for example, the, the, the court stressed that the um, Congress had considered and rejected uh, the legislation, and that was one of the things that made it constitute a major question. But Which course, is one it, of my points here. Yeah, and one of your points too. But I think we need more guidance about how to apply that because um, almost anything that anybody cares about at all, and, you know, that affects some industry and costs of, you know, you were likely to find a lot of bills introduced. Mm. Um, and so how do we draw that line? Now, I think, you know, I think you, I, I think this is a little bit different than the case where, I don't know, there's some regulation affecting the dairy industry and, you know, the Wisconsin congressional delegation introduces bills or something. I mean, uh, you know, the, clearly there's more the serious legislative interest in, in these issues. But I, I don't think the courts told us where to draw the line. Um, and um, I think the... Um, I think the uh, West Virginia was kind of an easy, relatively easy case that way because uh, it, the, there was really major, uh, maybe I should avoid that term, substantial interest in Congress. And it was really pretty clear that the administration was, was trying to do an end run. After, you know, they tried Congress, they couldn't get what they wanted. Um, and then they- But tried. isn't that exactly what, the department is doing here. They couldn't get the Equality Act passed, so let's just regulate. I, you know, I don't know. I mean, maybe, but um, I mean, uh, they're 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 what the intervening thing is the Bostock decision, right? So, yeah, right. right. And yeah. the one thing I'll just ask is, what is 
does it matter what the agency says about its own rule? So in the notice proposed rulemaking, the agency is saying this is economically significant under executive order 12866. Is that at all something that a court may consider to determine whether it's economically significant for purposes of the major question doctrine? So I would say it, 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 it's something you could consider, but the cutoff, there are a lot of regulations that meet the, that economic significance requirement, um, which is $100 million a year. So it's not nothing. Um, uh, it was set in 1981 when it was meant $100 million a year was more money than it is today. But there are a lot of regulations of industry um, where, you know, uh, um, that are really not that nobody's ever heard of, basically, um, that meet that test. Um, so I think maybe now, I think if Jennifer is right, uh, that um, women's sports could collapse as a result of, um, of including uh, well, transsexuals, that, that I think would be a much a better case for major I think question. it's important not to be hyperbolic and say that women's sports are going to collapse in their entirety. What, what is going to happen and what, what has already happened um, is that, that male-bodied athletes will take spots from individual women um, on, on teams, on the playing field. They'll take lanes in the pool. They'll take podium spots, awards, all American scholarships perhaps. Um, and each of those is an individual act of sex discrimination against the woman. Right. I do think, I, you know, I do think that, um, that the sports issue is harder because there are in not that many cases where your, you know, mus muscle mass and bone structure and so forth, uh, differences between uh, genders, uh, are relevant. They're not relevant in you know most educational activities, for example. Right. And the reason we have women's sports is at least because we think those things and maybe hormone levels uh, in particular um, are basically relevant. And that that does make it, I think, kind of a somewhat a special problem. Mm -hmm. um, now, other aspects may may be less so, like the locker room issue, for example. Um, and maybe that's something that the um, department wants to deal with. Yeah. Um, well, and we do have some questions from the audience that we probably should address. So let's just assume that the Title IX in athletics, that issue is a major question. Well, there's a question from our audience about whether Congress gave the Department of Education the authority to define sex in a manner that's non-binary. And so is that, assuming it is a major question, may the Department of Education deviate from the non-binary or define sex in a non-binary manner? I would say no, but because of how the statute is written with constant references to both sexes, meaning two, or the opposite sex, meaning one. Um, and look, you know, it was, it was passed in 1972. The phrase gender identity didn't make it into federal law at all until at least the 1990s, when I think it was mentioned um, as an exception to the Americans with Disabilities Act, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, so nobody was thinking about gender identity in 1972, um, but you know, it was very clear that the statute was being written to protect uh, disparate treatment of similarly situated students or, or faculty. Um, on the basis of binary sex, biological sex, that's you know, and Congress can change that. They can they can amend Title IX to add gender identity, and to add to make it non-binary, to take out the words both and opposite and things like that. I mean, Congress can do that tomorrow if it wants to. It hasn't done that. Um, so, uh, I'd like to just add two things. Um, one is I I. I do think that they're on somewhat stronger ground saying that they're defining discrimination on the basis of sex rather than redefining sex. Um, uh, at least that that potentially um, helps them with at least part of the argument. Um, the other thing I would say is I would find Jennifer's argument stronger without Bostock. Uh, 
Um, you know, I think Justice Alito, who uh, dissented in Bostock, uh, was right that Congress in its wildest dreams, I mean, if you think they weren't considering gender identity in 1972, they certainly weren't in 1964. Um, right. When the court, uh, when, when Congress passed Title VII. But Title VII doesn't use terms like both. Uh, yeah, I know. It's not yeah. so, I, and me, and I think that could be a distinction, but um, the and I think there's a really strong argument that, yeah, if you want to, um, you know, I think a lot of people had assumed if you want to cover discrimination on the basis of, say, sexual orientation, you got to amend the statute. But the court, the majority of the court didn't buy that. Um, and um, and that makes it less clear to me, at least, that, you know, that they're going to have the feeling that um, schools, that, that Title IX is totally different. But so I, I think that Justice Gorsuch was pretty clear that um, sexual orientation uh, and, you know, how you identify or present is not relevant to whether or not you can do a particular job, right? That, that was sort of the crux of his point. Whereas it's not just relevant in sports, it's dispositive. Not sexual orientation, but, but sex itself is dispositive. Sex whether you're a man or a woman is irrelevant to whether you can perform a job. And therefore the same is true is his argument for sexual orientation and, and transgender status. But sex itself is dispositive in sports and it's dispositive less, well, it may not be dispositive, but it's certainly relevant when it comes to who you're gonna live in a dorm with, who you're gonna share a locker room with, who you want to join a sorority or fraternity with. It's it's relevant. It's not relevant at all to whether or not you can be a funeral director. You know, I, I, I guess I would say, um, so I, I, I guess I would say at, at least um, in some contexts, it seems to me it is irrelevant. Um, you know, after all, Title um, Nine co covers a lot of things like harassment, um, like uh, discrimination grading or access to courses or other activities. And in many of those settings, um, um, uh, you know, it does seem um, like whether you're gay or not gay, uh, for example, is pretty irrelevant to what grade you should get on a paper in your English class. Uh, yeah, of course. And like the example you gave earlier about, you know, if somebody's getting kicked out of school because they come out as gay, but, but that is, that's not uh, what we're talking about here. We're talking about situations where your, your biological sex makes a difference. And, and men and women are not the same. We're equal, but we're not the same. Sex is not like race, where it's intercha we're interchangeable. And, and that's, that's the crux of the issue here. Um, that is the real crux of the issue. And, yeah. and you know, I think the court actually, to be honest with you, I think the court made a big mistake in tying Zarda and Bostock together and discussing sexual orientation um, and transgender status in the same case because they're not the same. But, but, but the real issue we're talking about is biology, male and female, and whether or not um, males and females are interchangeable. They are not. And therefore, you know, the sex you were born is relevant, not in intellectual pursuits or in most jobs, um, but, but in other areas and even in some jobs, which is why Title VII has a BFOQ exception, right? Because we recognize that in some cases, um, sex can be relevant in the workplace. Usually it's not. Um, yeah, but I, you know, I'd like to talk about sexual harassment a little bit if we can, because I think What's so interesting about that is, and you know, I think your average person doesn't realize that there is no federal law prohibiting sexual harassment. Sexual harassment is only unlawful as a species of discrimination. And the court has been very clear, both in the workplace context and in the education context, that something can rise to the level of discrimination if, if a workplace is so sexually charged or a classroom is so sexually charged that, that 
one sex isn't able to perform its job or access the education or is being treated you know, in a derogatory fashion, that is discrimination. Likewise, you know, if women are complaining that they're being assaulted and the school does nothing, but a man complains that he's assaulted and the school kicks the perpetrator out, that's sex discrimination because they're not taking the complaints of one sex seriously. But every dirty joke that's said in a, you know, a dormitory or even in a classroom or a workplace does not violate federal law. And the problem with the regulations uh, imposed by the Department of Education is it vastly expands the category of activity um, that can count as a federal violation beyond the discrimination context. So that's a whole separate issue, separate from you know, the biological sex versus versus gender identity issue. But but that is a whole nother way in which the agency has gotten away both from the statutory requirements and um, the jurisprudential contours of sexual harassment law. When, when you say that about the definition of sexual harassment, are you referring to the proposed definition as severe or pervasive or the current definition in the regulation, which is severe, pervasive and objectively offensive? Well, um, yeah, the, the 2020 regulation codified uh, Supreme Court precedent. So that mm -hmm. that the 2020 regulation tracked um, what the court has said about it. But but even that isn't enough, in my view, um, because the court has been clear that it, it one sex has to be treated differently than the other. If if. I hate to say it because it's bad and it should be punished under state law. But if you have an employer who's sexually harassing everyone in the workplace, male, female, you know, trans, gay, everybody, regardless, right? That's not discrimination. That's just bad behavior. And it might be unlawful under state law and should be, but it is not a violation of Title VII. And, and the court has always cabined at sexual harassment jurisprudence. It's been so careful to say that sexual harassment can rise to the level of discrimination. It isn't always in and of itself discrimination. And when it's not, it doesn't violate Title VII and it doesn't violate Title IX. But somehow the agencies have decided, you know, anytime an employer or, or a professor is being a jerk to everybody, they've committed a federal violation. And that's just not true. So I actually, we have to, uh, under state law, um, uh, we have to do two hours of sexual harassment training a year. And I just happened to finish mine because it was due April 1st. Um, and um, it's a video kind of interactive video kind of thing. And um, it, I mean, it, it, of course the, the um, University wasn't claiming that they were only enforcing federal regulations or right. whatever, but but it it you know it was an example of how at least in some quarters the you know the sexual harassment issues are being interpreted in a very broad way, and, and of course you know university doesn't ha can go beyond what federal law uh, of course requires as long as it doesn't run into the First Amendment but, and and should yeah. Uh, but I don't think, I, I think it's true that there's a lot of confusion also, um, say, among um, administrators about what constitutes sexual harassment and what doesn't. And um, the reason there's confusion among administrators is because the Department of Education has been telling them for a couple of decades now that every time a professor sleeps with a student, there's been a federal violation. That is not true if it's consensual. I mean, they've turned it into that, but that mm -hmm. the court has never said that. The law doesn't say it. So there's a lot going on here at the Department of Education that is well beyond the simple, you know, anti-discrimination mandate of Title IX. I mean, Title IX says one thing, don't discriminate on the basis of sex. And then it has a bunch of exceptions, right? Um, for single sex things. So. That's all it says. And we've created this laborness of mandates um, 
over the decades, but in particular with this this rule proposed by the Biden administration last year, that you know it has its tentacles in every aspect of the educational relationship from kindergarten through graduate school. Yeah, and that's a yeah, that's uh, definitely a point to consider. We have quite a few questions on the major questions doctrine that, and I'd like to just make sure we you both get a chance to answer them. So one of the I guess, criticisms of the major questions doctrine is that it will lead to interest groups generating a lot of fuss about a particular issue to elevate them to the point of being a major question. Do you see that as being the case here with some of the issues that you've discussed under Title IX? Um, I guess uh, as the one who's more skeptical about the uh, major question applying, um, I don't think I, I don't think that's I, I think there has obviously been a political effort to to elevate these issues, um, and that is partly you know um, maybe motivated by a desire on the political side to appeal to the Republican base, but I, I don't I don't think in this case it's um, necessarily you know that the motive is trying to elevate it to a major question. I do think that there is a risk. Um, that um, um, that there will at least be efforts to elevate issues to major question, and that a lot of it will depend on sort of what the media chooses to elevate. Um, what you know, for example, Tucker Carlson decides to talk about, um, and that is one reason why I think the sort of political significance prong is something that the court's gonna to have to be very careful with. Um, and, and also true on the other side, right? I mean, I've, I've been talking about, um, you know, we've been thinking in terms of uh, issues that are controversial with conservatives, but, um, but uh, you know, you could imagine um, uh, liberals in some cases trying to, to do the same thing and elevate, um, an issue in the hope of having a stronger legal argument. Uh, I think mostly people are not that sort of legally um, calculating people in the media or politicians, but but I wouldn't rule it out. I don't think most people have ever heard of the major questions doctrine, including probably the majority of lawyers. And so I don't think that people are elevating issues or making a big stink about them because they think that it might influence Justice Gorsuch, um, who they can't pick out of a lineup. Um, I think activists are elevating issues they care about on both sides, right? I think, you know, I want to give them the benefit of the doubt. I think climate activists and defenders of women's sports and pro-lifers and pro-choicers are elevating issues that they feel passionately about and they feel that they can make a difference. I don't think they're playing games with Justice Gorsuch. Well, and you both mentioned Bostock and the court's ruling in Bostock. Do you have thoughts on the 11th Circuit recently upholding the ability of a school to provide sex segregated bathrooms and that discussion of Bostock and the 11th Circuit case? So I, I think the 11th Circuit um, opinion was a correct interpretation of Title IX. Um, it, you know, it, it, that the particular case uh, involved a bathroom, but the, the ruling was not about a bathroom per se. The ruling was about whether or not um, Title IX prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex or on the basis of gender identity and whether um, discrimination on the basis of gender identity is part and parcel of discrimination on the basis of sex. It, it was a much more uh, theoretical opinion and opinion, a statutory interpretation opinion. Um, you know, the court did note that this, this, in particular, this was a school district that had accommodated the transgender students by, um, providing single use, single stall private bathrooms. Um, and that in fact, the, the policy was developed uh, years ago in consultation with LGBTQ consultants. Um, and so they did note that, you know, there was no animus there. This was the policy that they had developed in good faith. Um, 
so there was no, you know, there was no animosity there. They were when they were considering sort of the equal protection clause um, portion of the challenge. Um, so it was based on two things, the equal protection clause and Title IX. And I think that their statutory interpretation of Title IX um, was correct and calls into question the legality of these regulations, certainly in that circuit. Professor Farber, do you have any thoughts? I think there's a circuit split currently with the Fourth Circuit basically interpreting Title IX to also mean gender identity with respect to bathrooms and similar facilities. And then the 11th Circuit obviously just opined in the opposite manner. Um, so I haven't really focused on this issue closely. And with you. I mean, it seems like a fairly obvious uh, issue for Supreme Court review given a circuit split. Um, and I can't read Justice Gorsuch's mind. Uh, mm -hmm. So <laughs> I'm not sure what the court's going to do with it. Um, but, um, um, and, you know, and uh, um, obviously there are two different statutes. Title IX has its own history and its own language. Um, but, um, <sighs> But given Bostock, I just find it very difficult to know. Um, it seems to me there are a lot of the arguments here that really kind of applied in Bostock too. And um, and regardless of their merits, they didn't win. So I, th I think it's um, it's gonna be difficult. I, it may be the court will try to find some kind of middle ground. Um, I think these are cases that are crying out for a resolution by the Supreme Court. The problem is I don't know whether they'll get there because on the one hand, uh, the more progressive side, I think, is hesitant to appeal to a court that they perceive um, or to request cert from a court that they perceive as not friendly. Um, but there's another issue, which is that most of these cases, whether it involves sports or um, free speech issues or otherwise, in, you know, involve students, right? We're talking about Title IX, so it involves students. And students grow up and they graduate. And, and the, um, these cases take a long time to wind their way through the courts. And you know the Second Circuit has held, for example, in one of these cases that, that the girls don't have standing to bring the case because they graduated. So, uh, and I know that may be heard in bonk soon, but, but the point is that I think there are a lot of procedural and, and political hurdles to getting this before the court uh, at all. Although it, you know, it's, Without Supreme Court resolution, we're going to have a lot of conflicts between state and federal law, conflicts between circuits, um, conflicts between administrative law and, and statutory law. So we're going to have a, a lot of conflicts all over the country on Title IX. Um, and I hope the Supreme Court resolves them. Well, I, you know, I would, sorry, I would think that if the department comes forward with regulations that will make it difficult for the Supreme Court to avoid Mm -hmm. um, well, someone true. has to ask for cert, so it depends, right? That's true. That's true. But I, I you know, I think from the department's They're not going to reach out and grab it. You know, mm -hmm. but it, it's also possible that some district judge might issue a nationwide injunction or something like that and, and not, you know, not leave any choice to the department about whether to take it to the Supreme Court. I think There's we'll just... also something else that we haven't mentioned, and that's the Congressional Review Act, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, th the truth is that if Congress were really all that concerned about these agencies usurping their power, uh, there is something they can do about it. And um, unfortunately, they don't seem to have an appetite for that. Um, I, although I think that Representative Buck and maybe Ken Buck and Miller may have um, in the last Congress said they were going to put forward a Title IX Congressional Review Act resolution. Um, with the current Senate, that would be unlikely to pass, but I'd, I'd like to see Congress, you know, take back some of their power or at least try to. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the other problem is that um, the Congressional Re Review Act really only works when there's been an intervening election because um, those resolutions are subject to presidential veto. Uh, 
And it's it's just not very likely that Biden would um, sign a bill overruling his own agency. Right. But uh, it would still be nice to see them at least try to assert, you know, that this is beyond the scope of what this body intended. And yeah. that would at least, you know, sort of elucidate the issue for the public who doesn't necessarily understand the separation of powers issues, right? So, you know, if Tom Cotton were to take to the floor and say, the Department of Education has usurped this body's power, I, you know, people would listen. They, they'd start to understand, I think, some of the constitutional issues. Yeah, well, uh, uh, the House at least does seem to be taking um, a greater interest in using the um, con uh, Congressional Review Act um, they've had a couple of regulations, uh, uh, environmental regulations, one where they passed the resolution and one where I, I expect that they will, although we can't be sure. So it may be that we'll see more uh, activity in that. I think it, I think um, politically it might be an easier thing to get uh, the Republican caucus to agree on than, than um, some other uh, legislation. So uh, so we might see more of that. And I wouldn't be surprised to see it um, uh, in particular if they come down with a rule governing um, athletics. But uh, my crystal ball isn't all that great. So we'll see. Well, thank you for a lively discussion. And we, we know we have a lot of questions and we can answer some of those by email. So we appreciate your time and we thank you so much for attending this webinar. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Farnaz, I want to thank you and uh, Professor Farber and Jennifer, I want to thank you as well for your time and for your expertise. I want to thank our audience too for joining us. We of course greatly appreciate your participation. Please check out our website, fedsoc.org, or you can follow us on all major social media platforms at FedSoc to stay up to date with announcements and upcoming webinars. Thank you once more for tuning in and we are adjourned.